Hi friends, this is John and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. Welcome back. This is where we talk about agronomic science and cultural management practices. And it's also where we talk about just having fun and all the fun pieces that contribute to regenerating our relationships with the soil, with plants, and uh, and with each other. Uh, I'm really excited to have here on this uh, episode a longtime friend and someone who have come to really respect their operation and the innovative work they have done, Bob Jones from Chef's Garden. Bob, welcome. Thank you for being here. Tell us a little bit about your kind of your story, the background, the operation that you're working with today, and how that all came to be. John, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Our family has been farming for over six generations. We have been growing vegetables on our farm here for about 60 years in this location. Uh, My brother Lee and I operate the farm together with an amazing team of folks that we have gathered. And we have, like many of your listeners, we are on a, a transition or a continuum, if you will, of learning. And we certainly don't have this all figured out by any stretch of the imagination. But we're learning enough to excite us to try and learn more faster. We came out of a wholesale operation that my father ran back in the 70s and 80s. At his peak, he was about 1,200 acres of fresh market vegetables. He was selling wholesale to grocery chains anywhere east of the Rocky Mountains. We got a very good lesson in both economics and agronomics. We talk a lot in our operation about how modern agriculture in the U.S. today is broken both economically and agronomically. He was a large wholesale grower in that economic model of borrowing operating capital. In the 80s, if you remember the farm crisis, his last operating note was 23% interest. His largest was Kroger, and they were a 120-day pay. So we borrowed money at 23% and in essence loaned it to a wholesaler uh, for for five months. And we wondered why that model didn't work. And in 1983, our lending institution encouraged us to find a different advocation. So we started over. We didn't know anything other than agriculture. We didn't know anything other than vegetables. So we went from 1,200 acres in 1983 to six acres in 1984. We went from large volume, very small margins, wait for your money, to much, much smaller volumes, better margin because we were selling at a roadside stand and farmer's markets, and it was cash. So the economics, it was simply an economics 101. What my dad was noticing at the time was that it was at that time that the economics weren't working. The agronomics were broken as well. It was requiring greater and greater amounts of inputs to produce the same or less outputs. And that then contributed to the economic downside. While we were at farmer's markets in the mid to late 80s, we happened to meet some chefs. And we were selling at farm markets, farmer's markets in the Cleveland area. At one time, we got to 15 different farmer's markets every week. There was a different family member at every one. But restaurant chefs in Cleveland started buying at the farmer's market because they couldn't get good quality product from their purveyors. And we have been extremely fortunate in that chefs have taught a bunch of dirt farmers the food business. One of the things that we talk about is the possibility that many farmers today don't understand they're in the food business because they don't have a direct connection to the end consumer. They're in a commodity world. Yeah, unfortunately, many farmers today aren't in a food business, sadly. And when you don't have that immediate feedback from your consumers, immediate feedback is always helpful. It's just not always fun because when you screw it up, they're going to tell you and you got to make it right right away. So we're just very, very fortunate. We've been working with chefs for over 40 years. They've taught us the food business. They've taken us with them as they've moved to different locations. We're now shipping fresh produce to restaurants in 50 states and 17 countries. It worked really, really well until COVID when those restaurants all closed. That was not a fun time for any of us, but 
what it did was caused us to diversify the operation. So now instead of just being 100% restaurant, we also ship home delivery direct to homes in all 50 states. We have a corporate model where this time of the year we're doing corporate gifting for doctor's offices and attorney's offices and hospitals and insurance companies. Uh, and we also have a retail roadside stand, uh, which we had not done in over 40 years. And we brought that back out and started retail and picked up on that. So we now have four different channels that we're selling the same fresh produce through. And that has given us a strategy of diversification. At the same time, we have been growing for flavor. Chefs have been extremely consistent in their demands of us over the last 40 years. They asked for flavor, they asked for aesthetics, more flavor, shelf life, and even more flavor. If a chef doesn't have flavorful ingredients, they don't have anything. Home consumers are similar requests, but just with a little variance. So what home consumers are telling us is that they want food that looks good, tastes good, is good for them, and is clean. They're not really sure what that means. There's a lot of confusion in the marketplace surrounding organic, regenerative, conventional. We don't think, quite honestly, that it should be about the label you put on the food. It should be about the results of the tests on nutrient density that should qualify and quantify that food. Not the label, but the actual results. I know that, that you folks are really big on test and let the test determine uh, your next action. So are we, and we're learning a lot. What we're trying to do we built an on-farm lab several years ago, and we're trying to correlate growing practice to both flavor and nutrition. The medical community is starting to pay much more attention now and ask better questions and teach us. We're working with Dr. Nasha Winters, a holistic oncologist. We're also working with a cardiologist and a microbiologist on gut health. And we're learning as much as we possibly can about how do we grow food that they want for their patients. So our mission has evolved to growing exceptional vegetables, caring for each other in the land, and promoting a vegetable forward future. Wow. That's incredible, Bob. You just opened several really big pieces for us to go down, but having an on-farm lab, doing nutrient density testing and developing flavor. Like there's a lot for us to unpack there. But B, I want to bookmark that because I definitely want to uh, to explore that conversation with you fully. But uh, before we go there, tell us a little bit more about the scope of your current operation. You have these four different distribution channels, and you mentioned that you started with six acres back in 1984. But what does that look like today? Today we're operating about 400 acres of tillable land. We, up until 2023, we've been producing vegetables on about a third of that acreage, and then we would rotate around the farm. We are actually going to shrink that acreage a little bit. We're going to go from about 100 acres down to 75 because we felt like we've had too much waste of product. So our strategic plan for 24 is to actually grow revenue by 10%, but actually shrink the acreage. And it reminds me of my grandfather many, many years ago telling me that his grandfather told him if he couldn't make money on 100 acres, he knew he could make money on 10. And I think what he was trying to teach me was to get the farm to the size that you can manage it effectively and do the very best job that you can. Better is better before bigger is better. This is not about being the largest acreage farm in the countryside. We don't desire to be the largest. Our goal is to grow the best tasting, most nutritious and healthy food for the folks that are consuming that food. Rotating around, multi-species cover, growing our own cover crop seed. We're now getting into some small grains for our retail operation, some heritage varieties of grains to go along with and complement. My son and his wife have started a permaculture operation on the old home farm. So they've got 20 acres of multi-species pasture. They've got a thousand apple trees planted in the pasture. And then they are rotationally grazing through the pasture, beef, pork, turkeys, chickens, ducks, 
through there to turn the seconds. We'll take the first fruits into the retail stand and, and then convert the seconds into bacon. In addition to your vegetable produce operation, I know that at one point you also had a very significant salad greens and microgreens operation in, in the greenhouse. What is the current scale of that, and, and how does that um, piece contribute to the nutrient density angle that you're specifically seeking? So interestingly, uh, 400 tillable acres, between 75 and 100 acres of vegetables, about 15 acres of covered production. That 15 acre consists of everything, every type of covered technology that you can think of. From low tunnels to high tunnels to primitive 30-year-old greenhouses to glass greenhouses, computer controlled. The microgreens is a big piece of that. Leafy greens, both outdoors and indoors. We are a 12-month operation, so we provide product 12 months of the year to our customers. They demand that from us. It's a little difficult in Northern Ohio to have a 12 month production. We obviously don't have 100% of our product offerings. We do a hundred varieties of heirloom tomatoes, but those are seasonal. We have about 10 varieties of summer squash for the blossoms and for the squash. Those are seasonal. We stretch those seasons with high tunnels a month earlier and a month later, but we want to have squash blossoms nine months of the year. It's kind of like we want to go back and focus on seasonality for chefs and help them understand that there is a circadian rhythm to the earth and that it gives us different gifts at different times. We encourage chefs to, to have asparagus three meals a day for that 10 week period and then yearn for it the rest of the year. Uh, but then go into... <laughs> go into fresh green peas or green beans, and then in its summer squash, and end in fall squash. We're, there's plenty of time for carrots and beets in the fall and the winter because we can root sell or store those for these folks. The leafy greens, the microgreens, the edible flowers are 12 months of the year. We're in agriculture, John, but we are really in culinary, and so we follow their schedule more than ours. Our busiest times of the year are the last two weeks of December, the week of Valentine's and Mother's Day week, because those are the three busiest restaurant timeframes of the entire year. So when they're busy, consequently we're busy and we must have product for them at that time of the year. Oh, thank you, Bob. That's a, that's a fascinating overview. I know I've really enjoyed visiting your operation and just seeing the, the sheer complexity. Like when you talk about 75 acres of vegetables, well, that's comparatively easy if you're growing five crops. But uh, you're not. You're growing dozens, probably hundreds of crops. And then, and the tomato example, dozens or hundreds of different varieties of each of those crops. And so that, there's, a, there's a tremendous degree of complexity involved in your operation that I've come to really respect and appreciate. The interesting thing, there are about 800 varieties of plants that we grow. We sell each one of them in about four or five different size classifications and in multiple package offerings. We have way too many product SKUs. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> but our chefs have been very consistent in that they demand a consistent supply of high quality product on a continual basis. Many times our chefs have told us that they love working with farmers other than the inconsistency. Many farmers have beautiful green beans for two weeks and then they're out for three weeks and then they're back in for a week. And they back in the early years of working with chefs, they actually told us that they would prefer inferior quality product because they could get it consistently. But at least well, they knew what, what to expect. That was a long time ago. It's hard to work with chefs of this caliber. They are under an unbelievable amount of pressure to perform at a very high level night after night after night. And if they don't have great ingredients, they can't do their job. Our job is to be a support to them. If we can't make our customers' jobs and lives easier by working with us, then they won't. We have a saying here on the farm, if we don't take care of our customers, somebody else will. And so I think that understanding that part of it. 
Yeah, I think that's that's obviously true for all of us who have customers, but uh, sometimes easy to lose sight of that if you're busy as a farmer growing crops out in the field. So I want to get back to this conversation that you opened on flavor and nutrient density and growing food as medicine. There is so much for us to unpack there. Let's start with the flavor piece, perhaps, or take it any direction you want to take it. But how do you grow flavor? It's a very interesting question. I think that certainly color is flavor. And so we hear oftentimes people talk about eat the rainbow. The better color you can have in a vegetable, the better flavor and coincidentally, the better nutrition you're going to have. We were selecting varieties. We don't use any GMOs. We've been selecting open pollinated heirloom varieties for decades and then trying to create as healthy a soil as possible and then allow those genetics to express themselves. It's almost a little bit like good prenatal care. Not almost. It's exactly the same. How do you create a very, very healthy environment for that young organism to take root and grow? We didn't understand the piece about nutrition came within the last 10 years. We had been growing for flavor because that's what our customers demanded of us. So we took about learning good soil health. And I want to make sure that in our conversation, I give a lot of credit to those folks that, that I've learned from over the years. I was looking at my bookshelf this morning, and I believe that you and I were in the same class. It was the Reams Basic Soils Seminar taught by Dan Scow in January of 2003. Now, I took that class three times because I I had to repeat it. I have to read everything a few times for it to really sink in. But then as I thought about this, I had a local organic dairy farmer. A couple of his grandkids work with us on the farm now, Mr. Hinman. And Mr. Hinman told me, you don't know how much you have to know just in order to know how little you know. (laughs) <laughs> Wait a minute. Can, can you run that past us again? <laughs> I'll run it by you one more time because I've been chewing on it for 20 years. You don't know how much you have to know just in order to know how little you know. And it, uh-huh. it, a simplified version is we didn't know what we didn't know. We were so naive to this whole thing. Now, as I, you know, we talk a lot about soil diversity from a microbiological aspect. The diversity that I have been blessed with over the last 20 years, this is a short list. I'm going to read it to you. Starts with my dad. He was one of my best teachers. I miss him terribly. My brother Lee, Doc Scow, Edwin Blosser, John Kemp, Terry Reams, Steve Groff, Dave Brandt, Jimmy Emmons, Christine Jones, Elaine Ingham, Ray Archuleta, Adam Chappelle, Gabe Brown, Don Huber, Blake Vence, Raymond Yoder from Mount Hope, Ohio taught me a lot about leadership, and Arden Anderson. And then I've blended that with people like Jim Collins, Simon Sinek, Dave Ramsey, Seth Gooden, Pat Lencioni. That's where I think that diversity is the key to life. All life. Soil life, plant life, human life. If we look at what's going on in the world around us right now, Diversity is key, and we have something to learn from people that we may not even agree with. Well, I'll pick it up then. Uh, I would uh, I would suggest that we actually may be able to learn most from people who we don't agree with, because we can perhaps learn from their perspectives, even if we end up still not agreeing with them in the future. Having a debate can sharpen our own thinking and improve our own thought processes even if it's to defend what you already know is correct. But maybe, just maybe, someone has a perspective on life that we had not considered. And while we may not totally convert to that way of thinking, it may cause us to adjust and adapt our thinking to a better way to do something. I've been very, very blessed in my life to have had exposure to these folks who I have have such great, I hold in such high regard as people who really are passionate 
about their livelihood and learning as much as they could, but also sharing that information and teaching it with others. I think that we are called to help as many people along this path of life that we possibly can. So learning, learning this stuff and keeping it to yourself would be, a, would be criminal. Yeah, freely you have received and freely share. I think that was one of the, certainly one of the impetus for me starting this podcast and doing our webinar series and trying to get information out there. But so you had you had started. Uh, you spoke about genetics and the um, work that you were doing with heirloom species, and then uh, you mentioned that a decade ago you started working with nutrition or really started appreciating the impact of nutrition. How has your operation evolved in both of those aspects, both in aspects of genetics and in how you manage nutrition? From a genetic perspective, it is still totally focused on non-GMO, open-pollinated varieties. We have searched for and found plant breeders in different parts of the country and world that specialize in different crop families, and we have financially supported those Plant breeders are like starving artists, John. Very much so. Passionate about their work, but it may take them an entire career to find a real winner. Yep. And so what we've tried to do is find folks that were really passionate about plant breeding on carrots, on peas, on tomatoes, and support that work. And then in exchange, we could provide culinary evaluation with our customer base, which is what the plant breeders really desired was what characteristics are the most important and we should be selecting for? Not through genetic modification, but through genetic selection. On a more localized basis, we see with cover crop seed and with dry bean seed, which are really the only two that I produce and save, a few varieties of tomatoes and peppers, but for the most part, those are purchased in. But we see generational improvement when we grow generation two, generation three, generation four from seed that was saved from plants that were grown on our farm in our location, and they become accustomed to this climate and these soils, you see generational improvement. How significant? Can you give us some examples of the generational improvement that you've observed? Because this is a phenomena that uh, many people talk about, and, and I've observed it in some instances to be remarkable improvement, like not five or 10%, but in some cases, as much as 30 to 40% improvements in, in uh, as little as a single generation in terms of plant expression, overall yield production. And the reality is I don't have enough experience to know if they are outliers or not. I imagine or assume that they are, but what, uh, what have you observed? I would say that our observations would be similar. There is significant statistical improvement you wouldn't notice a 5 to 10% improvement, but you would notice a 30 to 40% improvement. You would notice a 100% improvement, certainly. I've never done statistical analysis of that per se. It's just not a big enough part of our business. It requires an additional layer of management that we just don't have the bandwidth for right now. And there are some crops that we just don't have the best climate. There's a reason why there's so much seed produced in the Pacific Northwest. They have great exactly. climate in the, in those exactly. valleys in Washington. And so we let them do what they do well. It's significant enough to mention it is, I guess, what I would say in that we want to grow crops that are more and more accustomed to this climate and these soils. With 800 varieties, there's just no way. Yeah, so... Thanks for sharing those thoughts on the genetics piece. Uh, how has nutrition evolved in, in your operation over the last 40 years and nutrition management? It's really interesting in that what we are seeing, first of all, when you compare to USDA averages, it's a very low bar. Depending on what white papers you read, we have lost between 50 and 70 percent of the nutrient density of food produced in this country. Unfortunately, some of the work that I've seen was research that was conducted in the early 90s, and it looked at the nutrient density of food from 1940 through 91. And at that time, the average reduction in nutrient density was about 40 percent. That was now 30 years ago. 
we believe that nutrient density in fresh produce today is decreasing at an increasing rate. In other words, it's falling faster. When I look and talk to customers and we show them that study, and then we show them the plant health pyramid that this guy put together, and we talk about 99% of the food produced in this country would not le meet the minimum of level one, we can see why. And if you overlay nutrient density of food produced in this country with the incidences of human health maladies, they're inverse relationships. As our food nutrition has decreased, our health problems have increased. It also mirrors the advent of chemistry and agriculture. As we've used more tons per acre of synthetic inputs, our nutritional density has gone down and our health problems have gone up. We have the cheapest per capita spending of any industrialized nation in the world on food. And probably the highest per capita spending on health care. Exactly. You took the words out of my mouth. Yep. There's a direct connection here. And the medical community is just now starting to take note of that and saying, maybe, just maybe, we could use food as medicine. And so we're starting to get a lot more play on that. And people are interested in asking more questions. Healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy people, healthy planet. It seems to me that you are in a particularly strong position with the uh, with the history that you have of selecting for flavor and the broad diversity of crop species. You have a particularly valuable perspective on the variation in nutrient density, the possibilities of nutrient density, and uh, with the doctors that you described that you're working with, uh, also associating that and, and really quantifying what defines food as medicine, or perhaps the question is not quantifying that so much as it is what is needed to put that into actual practice. So have there been any conversations that you've participated in in, in uh, looking at some of the very flavorful species that you're producing as medicinal species? Yes, and we're learning every day. There's point your listeners to, uh, if they want to research this a little bit further, Aaron Martin in North Tulsa, Oklahoma, working with Jimmy Emmons. They have a Veggie RX program. Uh, it's one of the places that you can look and see this. It's a great time to be in the vegetable business. The plant forward movement. Food as medicine, I think you'll see be renamed as food as health because there are negative connotations with taking your medicine. Take your medicine, young man. We want it to be food as health. We want there to be an alternative to being sick. I don't remember what, I think it was Arden Anderson who talked a lot about dis-ease. It's not really exactly. disease, it's dis-ease. And he also said something else I'll never forget. There's no such thing as junk food. There's either junk or there's food. All of those things come up and pop up in my memory from 15, 20 years ago that some of those forward-thinking thought leaders were really on to something. They were just ahead of their time. There was another perspective that Arden brought forward for me that um, I still remember a couple decades after I first heard it, and that was we tend to divide health and our perception of health, and he was referring to people and human health, into these two polarities. Either you're healthy or you're sick. But in fact, it's not those two polarities. It's a spectrum, and you have vital health on one end of the spectrum, you have disease on the other end of the spectrum, and then in between those two, you have this state that Arden referred to as pre-disease, where unfortunately far too many people are, where they may not have the visual expression of disease, but they don't have, uh, or symptomatic expression of disease, but they don't have vibrant health. And that was such a powerful analogy because we see the same to be true in so many agricultural fields from a plant health perspective as well. And people are starting to take notice. You asked about what types of conversation. So we're having conversations with the medical community. We're also having some very interesting conversations with the insurance community. There is an insurance company out of Florida who's giving folks a blood test because they have found that when they find cancer 
when they find heart disease, when they find kidney disease at stage zero or stage one, they can treat those diseases for about 25% of the cost that it does. Typically, symptoms apparently, I'm not a doctor, but apparently symptoms show up in most of those diseases at stage three or stage four. So as you're referring to, once you get along that spectrum towards disease, then your body starts expressing that in multiple different ways. And we go to the doctor and we find out, oh my gosh, I didn't know I was sick, but I have stage three cancer. I have stage four cancer. When they can determine that at stage zero or stage one and can treat it for 25% of the cost, there's a lot of money to be made in the insurance industry because profit in insurance is the difference between claims and payouts. If they can pay out 75% less and keep the, they'll, they'll give you a 10% reduction in your claims and lower their payouts by 75%. So the biggest issue that they now have is we have found these things with this early detection blood testing. How do we help those folks? When people find out they're sick, their first question to their physician is, what can I do to help myself? In the cancer example, we're, we're going to operate, so we're physically going to cut a tumor out, or we're going to do chemotherapy, or we're going to do radiation. All of those are things that happen to you. What does the patient do? What can the patient do? We all know that there is a spiritual side of healing and the attitude that people come about healing with, but there's also the diet. What Nasha Winters says is that if you put a cancer patient on a ketogenic diet and you eliminate sugar from that diet and you eliminate carbohydrates from that diet or greatly reduce them, that the chemotherapy that they undergo, the side effects of that are reduced by about 50 to 60%. Chemotherapy wow. patients will lose their hair if they're on a ketogenic diet. The metabolic approach to cancer Probably the, one of the most stark things that Nasha has ever said to me is the best way to manage a cancer diagnosis is to prevent it. And we now know in this country how to prevent it. There's just not a lot of money to be made by doing that. Therein lies the problem yeah. that we've talked about before. Let's come back to the uh, insurance company example of uh, being able to treat with early diagnosis for 25% of the cost. My question is to treat how? Is that still a medical treatment or uh, are you in, implying that there is a food treatment approach? I'm again, I'm not a physician. I, I'm a farmer. What I'm doing is reading a lot of white papers and talking to a lot of folks to have a better understanding about this to see where, where we might as farmers help. We believe that a regenerative farmer should be a part of everyone's healthcare team. You should have a physician. You should have a health coach. You should have a really good regenerative farmer that you know and you can buy food from. I think that it's certainly a blend of Western medicine and a healthy diet may in fact be the best solution in the end. But again, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I think we can prevent a lot of our own problems. I did have an oncologist tell me that if women would consume three servings of cruciferous vegetables a day, that they would not get breast cancer. The glucosinolates or sulfur compounds in cruciferous vegetables have a tremendous impact, negative impact on cancer cells. Unfortunately, if somebody eats three servings of Brussels sprouts a day, you don't want to be around them. And so we have to find a better way to do that. What we have discovered through our testing is that microgreens could be the answer to that. 10 to 40 times greater bioavailability of the nutrients and nutrient density that are in them without the negative side effects. Uh, and you can eat a lot less by volume and get the same amount of compounds, the, the glucoraphanin, and the myronase and myronase and radishes to, and when you chew that, you form sulforaphane in the human body, and that's a natural chemoprotectant. There's lots of I don't want to go too far down to that, but there's food as medicine, food as health is real, and it's good for all of us as producers of fresh vegetables around the country, and as consumers, it's good for all of us. 
Well, I think in generally the, the listeners to the podcast um, are generally in alignment with that concept. And the question quickly becomes, how can we as farmers, as producers, do two things? One is, how can we grow that more effectively? And secondly, when we do the grow this more effectively and produce nutritious food, how can we be compensated for the food quality that we produce? So the compensation question is a whole ball of wax unto itself. But uh, I'd like for us to dig into a little bit. Uh, how have you, I don't feel like we fully unwrapped yet. How has your nutrition management evolved on the farm? And what is your approach to producing nutrient density? Okay, I'll try and pull that back in. I appreciate you bringing me back in here a little bit. Soil health, as we all know and agree, is a three-legged stool, physical, chemical, biological. Addressing all three and finding practices that positively impact all three are the quickest way. Looking at reliable soil testing, the whole debate around strong acid, weak acid extract, what soil test can you have that it most closely replicates root exudates? Understanding base saturation, getting a balance in the soil, then testing plant sap. We do plant sap analysis here on the farm every other week, and then we foliar feed to make up those differences. It's all about giving the plant what it needs and creating that optimal environment to the best of our ability so that plant's genetics can express themselves and protect themselves. Just like in a human body, there's so many unbelievable parallels between the human body and the plant. Even to the ranges of minerals within sap and blood. There's a reason why that they line up and why food, nutritionally dense food, helps the human body is because of those parallels. And so getting plants as healthy as we possibly can and creating an environment for them to be healthy and express those genetics it is really the key to food as medicine. So it all really does tie in together. Where we've struggled a little bit on our oper in our operation is 10 years ago, we decided that we wanted to not use any more herbicide. And so we came across, uh, wasn't new to us, it was new to us, but not a new idea of stale seed bed. We do way too much tillage in our operation because it's small seed vegetables. And we will till, let the weeds germinate, till again very shallow, let the weeds germinate, till again very shallow, plant a crop, then cultivate it multiple times. We're absolutely destroying soil fungal matter because we till so much. We're on a journey right now of converting to no-till on large seeded vegetables and strip till for small seeded vegetables. I have not been able to find large scale no-till carrots and beets. I can find some no-till operations that are one to 10 acres, and most of those are not-for-profits, which I would prefer not to be. Um, <laughs> I would. <laughs> um, I, I do appreciate the fact about profitability not being a dirty word. And I also know that in regenerative agriculture, if you're not direct marketing, it's darn near impossible because you can't differentiate your product. We have to be, as a community of regenerative farmers, price makers, not price takers. Once you understand that business phenomenon of being a price maker, creating the markets for yourselves and establishing those markets. And John, we've just been at this a really long time. And so we're, we understand how blessed we are to have developed this through culinary and the culinary is funding the research. There isn't anybody paying us anymore for nutrient dense food yet. I think that that market's coming. I think this food as medicine market is expanding. Well, yes, yes, and yes, and no, Bob. You took the words out of my mouth that no, you're not being paid for nutrient density, but you are being paid for flavor. And that there are, in fact, many people who care about flavor, not just chefs. At one point in our conversation, you described the four characteristics that retail consumers are looking for. And flavor still remains one of the four. Right. My dad used to say all the time, 
Kids don't eat vegetables today because vegetables don't taste good. If vegetables tasted good, children would eat more of them. And so our job as farmers is to make sure that what we're growing tastes good. And then the yeah. demand will follow. Yeah, and you know, that's such an obvious point, but I think it's it's one that we often miss because it's so obvious, is that I have a three-year-old daughter, and as long as we have broccoli from our own garden, which is a large portion of the year, it's like we can put a plate of raw broccoli on the table and we don't have to serve anything else for dinner. She'll just eat the whole plate all by herself. She loves it. Once we get to the point of the year where we don't have our own broccoli and we start buying broccoli, no more broccoli for dinner. It's like there's this obvious pattern of how quality and flavor influences behavior. I remember Doc Scow teaching us about hay grown on a healthy farm and hay grown on a sick farm and cows being able to tell the difference. And if you put a cake of hay from a healthy field and one from an unhealthy field in front of the cow, they would eat the healthy one and leave the other one for three days. And then when you would take the healthy one away, they'd go off a of feed for three days. And when they started to starve, they'd finally eat the unhealthy hay again. But in many instances, the cows are smarter than we are. I'll respond to that and by saying that I used to have that perspective that cows and mice and wild animals were more sensitive than we are and they're smarter than we are. But as I observe different people, particularly children, I'm coming to the conclusion that, in fact, they're not smarter than we are, but we've just drowned out the information with all of our intellectual stimulation. As we become adults and we force ourselves into certain patterns of behavior and, and thinking and so forth, uh, we don't pay attention. We start paying attention less. And so we, we have that innate wisdom, that intuition, if you want to call it, whatever it is. Like We have what it takes to select that which really is best for us but most of us ignore it or we drown it out. So what you're saying is we started out as children smarter than the cow, and then as we watered down our education, they became smarter than us. <laughs> well, I would say we started out as aware as the cow, and over time we lost that awareness. <laughs> we drowned out that awareness, yep. <laughs> No, I, th I think that you're, you're absolutely right, and that, that is that what we understand, what we're starting to understand today, that we may have gotten some of this wrong, and we're going back and rethinking how we grow plants and starting over. My dad used to always say, I think back to things that he taught me, that as farmers, we're just trying to become as good of farmers as they were 100 years ago, and that was before we tried to hit the easy button and make farming so simple. And now we're having to go back and actually learn soil chemistry, soil biology. And when we do that, we will have greater results and in, in everything that we're trying to accomplish. Bob, it's a relatively rare farming operation that has a laboratory associated with it, particularly a laboratory that is, has a particular focus on uh, identifying and defining a further understanding of nutrient density and optimal health. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been learning with the lab? What, what, uh, what have you discovered and what are you hoping to discover in the future? You know, we had heard from our customers for 20 to 25 years that the product that we were supplying them tasted better and lasted longer than anything else they could buy. Part of that, I'm sure, was due to genetics because we were growing, selecting and, and growing product varieties that the flavor had not yet been bred out of. We all understand the concept of the Burger King tomato. Tomato breeders around the world did exactly what we asked them to do 75 years ago. That's to breed a tomato that, that would be very consistent in size and shape and withstand a truck ride from Mexico to New York. Flavor was left along the side. We've now come back and picked those things up. Part of it was genetics. Part of it was the fact that we were picking it fresh and delivering it to the restaurant the same day. So we would pick it in the morning and we would take it into the restaurant this afternoon and it would be on a dinner plate tonight. Just being fresh product. 
USDA tells us today that fresh produce loses about 10% of its nutritive value every day post-harvest. They also say that the average produce in a grocery store today is 14 days old. And you've lost 100% in 10 days, according by that math. <laughs> I was never great at math, John, but that dog won't hunt. So we're, we're consuming, and then we take grocery store produce home, and it either rots in the refrigerator or it certainly doesn't taste very good, and we wonder why. As restaurant chefs were telling us the product tastes good and lasts longer, it was all very anecdotal information. We wanted to understand causation because we wanted to know how to do more of it. How do we do more of the right things and less of the wrong things? And so the only way that we could figure out how to do that, now we're talking about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, is I would reach out to the land grant institutions in our fine country and would ask them for help in researching this. I got a lot of snickers and sneers and laughs and they just weren't very interested in it. And as you know, today, they're a little more interested in how regenerative farming actually works because it works. So we, we went about finding that out on our own because we just we weren't getting any help through the research organizations in our state. So we just decided to do it on our own. We started very, very simple, crude lab that we built in an old truck and set it on the ground and then... Uh, just before COVID, we built a lab that would expand that concept and correlate the minerals, correlate the vitamin, the phytonutrients. Because we also grow in a greenhouse, we also did a lot of light work and understanding light's impact on plant growth. It's fascinating science. We can actually change the flavor of basil by light we can change it wow. from sweet to spicy. We can increase phytonutrient uptake by what colors of the light spectrum we apply to that light in the last 20% of its growth. You can pull phytonutrients, you can pull color, you can pull flavonoids out. And so once we started learning that in the lab and in the greenhouse, we could apply those same teachings that, or learnings, if you will, to what was going on in the field. We started understanding that for years, some of the sweetest spinach that we sell to our customers was in the wintertime. And we actually called it ice spinach, playing off of ice wines. Right. Very, very high sugar content if in the shortest days of the year. Not just the shortest days, but you may not be in the zone of cloud cover off of Lake Erie, but you also have fairly cloudy weather during the winter months, no? Lower light levels, lower temperature, higher humidity. There's an inverse relationship in spinach that we had no idea about. We had the cardiologist who's telling us they want high nitrate nitrogen leafy greens. Nitrate nitrogen to nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a blood vessel dilator. You see beet chews and beet powders with nitric oxide. So they were asking us to produce high nitrate nitrogen leafy greens, which agronomically was against everything I'd ever been taught. If you get the nitrate nitrogen too high, you're going to have aphids, which I have proved before, and it's true. So we have to do that in a controlled environment because they want high nitrate nitrogen. In spinach, in field production spinach, in the summertime, you can get much higher nitrate content, but the sugars are very low. And in the winter, it's an inverse relationship. The nitrates are dropping because you don't get nitrogen uptake in cold soils, but you do get sugar concentration. So you have the very sweetest sugar, very sweetest spinach in the wintertime, but you don't get much nitrogen content in that sugar. Those are the kinds of things and examples of things that we have learned over the years. We had no earthly idea. We knew that spinach was sweeter in the winter than it was in the summer. Now we're looking at it and having a better understanding of exactly what causes those things. I'm particularly intrigued by the light conversation. One of the pioneers of understanding the impact that light has on people and animals was uh, a researcher named John Ott. And uh, I have a couple of John's books. I, I forget 
exactly what their title, but his research is certainly worth reading and understanding because all of a sudden you realize the the light spectrum, the limited light spectrum that we are exposed to from fluorescent light bulbs and different types of light bulbs can actually have a significant detrimental health impact. But you, you mentioned something interesting that caught my attention. As you learned about the influence of different light spectrums in the greenhouse, you were actually able to also take that and, and apply that knowledge to field production. What does that look like? I can't imagine you're having different light bulbs uh, out in the field. No, not different light bulbs out in the field, certainly. You cannot beat the sun, right? God made the sun and he made plants and, and they work in concert with one another. Understanding in a controlled environment where you can, you can control variables helped us to understand cause and effect. We trialed dozens of light manufacturers in controlled environment because every light manufacturer I ever talked to said, tell us exactly what spectrum you want and we'll build a fixture for you. Well, I didn't know what spectrum of light I wanted. Light is spectrum, which is color, intensity, and duration. I didn't know, and there wasn't a book I could find that said lettuce likes this spectrum and spinach likes this spectrum. Now I know that red lettuce likes a different spectrum than green lettuce, and it, all lettuce needs different intensity, duration, and spectrum at stage zero versus stage one, two, three, and four. And what happens in stage four of growth of leafy greens when you subject it to blue light. Understanding and learning those things helped us apply some of those things or maybe at least better understand. We found a light manufacturer. It's an LED light. It's a dynamic light. We can actually set LED diodes are all made in China and they're all virtually the same. It's the control of those lights. I can now set in the laptop that I want Tuscan Sun on May 1st. And they have taken the measurements of intensity, duration, and spectrum all over the world. The big data, this data is available. And so then I can duplicate the sun. I get an orange low-intensity sunrise to a, a low-intensity white, high-intensity white at midday, back to low-intensity white to sunset. And you can duplicate that and then manage to that. With leafy greens in a lab environment, it's such a short season. You can replicate the cycles so much faster and learn quicker. We're now managing the greenhouse lights with dynamic LED. We're setting a daily light integral. So how many light units we want that crop to receive. It measures how much natural sun comes in on a sunny day and then makes up the difference. So you're getting energy management, but also light management. If you oversaturate a plant, it will shut down. It ties in very well to better understanding in the field, photosynthetic efficiency. How do we grow a plant and how does a healthy soil react in maximizing photosynthetic efficiency? Because what we're really selling is energy, right? Produce is energy for the human body. We're converting light energy from the sun and CO2 and oxygen and water into another form of energy. Photosynthesis is just energy conversion. And then our bodies can take that in as food and convert it to energy again. So maximizing the amount of energy that we can pack in and do it as efficiently as possible while growing a great flavored product it's a fascinating science. Creation is an amazing thing. And if you laid it all out on a continuum, it's a mile long and we understand the first few inches. <laughs> yeah. You know, and speaking about light, the, the one piece that you pointed out that really intrigued me was the differences in lighting desires between red and green lettuce. And, you know, when you think about color variation on a leaf, then uh, to some degree that is going to be associated with the content of the various um, carotenoids and which are all photon receptors. So you have the ability to intercept different wavelengths to varying degrees. 
and that is going to obviously have a, a produce a market influence. Leaf temperature is different in red lettuce and green lettuce under the same light because of that exact same thing that you're talking about. Yeah. It's just all things, different things to learn and different variables that we didn't know before now actually even existed. We didn't know what yeah. we didn't know. I'm curious, are you also measuring carbon dioxide flux as uh, uh, in, the, in the crop canopy or in the environment as you have these different variations of photosynthetic efficiency? Absolutely, because you can grow with less light at higher CO2. So when you're looking at energy management within a controlled environment area, you can raise the CO2 level and lower the amount of daily light integral needed to grow the crop. And so understanding not only cause and effect, but cost of each is critically important. When you get to larger scale vertical grow, where you're talking about these LEDs becoming sole source lighting versus supplemental lighting, the understanding the relationship between photosynthesis, temperature, humidity, CO2, all again, another fascinating science. So you might be one of the very few people who actually has a qualified opinion or qualified perspective on the possible impact of, of CO2 on nutrient density. Because this is, this is a question that has come up. There's been a couple of research papers published and uh, from my perspective, as, as I understand it right now with the data that I've been exposed to, we don't really know the full scope of how elevated CO2 levels in the environment are going to influence plants and influence crop nutrient density. But from what I am surmising at this point, my, my understanding at this point is that for undomesticated plants, for wild plants growing in the environment, it's possible... Most of the data that I've seen so far points to elevated CO2 levels leading to declines in carbohydrate density and in protein density, which is interesting. But in managed crops, in managed soil where we are managing nutrition, it seems to be having the opposite effect, that as CO2 increases, you're actually getting increases in nutrient density. And it's because that increased carbon dioxide level is also associated with nutrient management or with lighting management as you are doing or, or various different facets. What have you observed? The first thing that I would say to you is we have not correlated CO2 to nutrient density yet. That's on the radar, but we have not done the tests in the lab to correlate those. I guess how I would answer the question is that light, like CO2, like nutrients in solution, there is always a correlation effect or one affects the other, but also there's always a law of diminishing return, just like with light. At some point, the plant reaches saturation of photosynthetic efficiency and additional light in the early stages is inefficient at best and at, at continued higher light levels is actually detrimental, and the plants slow down. I had the opportunity to visit Leamington, Ontario two weeks ago, and I was in a 12-acre hydroponic pepper operation, and they're now measuring electrical activity within the xylem and the phloem at two different points on a pepper plant. Not electrical conductivity, electrical activity. And when the clouds go away and the sun comes out, the plant is happier and the electrical activity speeds up in the plant to a point. You can get saturation. And when you get saturation, now all of a sudden you don't have what you need. So looking at light saturation, like CO2 saturation, there's a law of diminishing return. that You can have too much of a good thing. What I don't understand yet is the correlation and the interaction between them. We do know that there is a direct impact between light and CO2 to photosynthetic activity. I would believe and surmise that there is absolutely the same correlation to nutrient density, but I have not calibrated that yet, or I, I don't understand it completely. 
That's a very important point, Bob, and thank you for emphasizing that again, because it means that uh, when research is being conducted, even out in the in the field, in open environment research, when research is being conducted to evaluate the impacts of CO2 on nutrient density, we have to include lighting as a variable and recognize that research that is conducted in the southeastern United States doesn't necessarily apply to more northern climates with different lighting conditions. And, you know, this is... This is one of the the fundamental criticisms that I have about virtually all of the carbon sequestration research. Like there, there is this plethora of research being conducted and papers being written on the ability to sequester carbon. And we understand the very wide range of variability that it has. But you know, I have never yet once, not a single time, have I read a paper on carbon sequestration that measured the photosynthetic efficiency and the photosynthetic variability of the crop that they were measuring carbon sequestration for. It's like, isn't that the absolute fundamental prerequisite that we know can be highly variable? That would determine to a great extent the efficiency of the sequestration in the first place. Yeah, it can vary by a factor of 5x, so why aren't you measuring it? <laughs> right. Well, you think about what... what uh, the research community has done on nutrition. Dietitians like to blow apart a vegetable into its component parts. Uh, the best example I can give you is lycopene in a tomato. Lycopene, the scientific community has determined, is very effective at prevention of prostate cancer. And they say now that maybe you should have lycopene tablets or lycopene supplements. Fascinated by um, Michael Pollan's in defense of food. How about if we just eat the tomato? Because what we don't know as the dietary community is, what is the synergistic effect of all of the other compounds that are contained in that tomato and the nutrition exactly. and the interaction between them? Uh, it's just you can't blow it apart and look at one individual thing in the absence of everything else around it. That's not how nature works. Exactly. And, and so it doesn't and always we, work that way. That's why I'm such a big fan of on-farm research. We may, may not be as polished as the university researchers, but we can get to a meaningful conclusion much quicker. And I might add, a lot more efficient. And just as in the example that we were just talking about, about the lighting research that you've been conducting, it seems frequently that well-informed farmers as citizen scientists seem to often understand the large range of variables, multiple variables that can influence the outcomes of a study more so than uh, researchers who want to narrow things down to single factor analysis. I think, John, that that's because we're farmers and we have dealt with our entire life a plethora of flexibilities or variables that impact our livelihood. It is weather, it is markets, it is all of these different things that come at you all at once at the risk of, of referring to my father too much. He used to tell me when I was a younger farmer, plan on absolute ideal weather 20% of the time and you'll never be disappointed. But he, And have a plan for how you're going to farm under ideal conditions. When you get the absolute right amount of rainfall and the temperatures are right, you don't have an early freeze or you don't have a late frost, but then also have a plan for a drought year and how are you going to farm differently in that year than you would in ideal? And how would you farm if you had a very, very wet year? You had a monsoon year. How would you farm under those conditions? And you make a plan for all of those eventualities when you're not in the heat of the battle. Then when those situations present themselves, you say, oh, I have a plan for that. And you go to the shelf and you pull that off and you say, okay, when we're in a drought year, we're only going to plant what we have the ability to successfully irrigate because we can't count on regular rains. So understanding variability in our world 
we just have an advantage because we grew up on farms and in nature and we learned from those lessons even though we probably didn't know we were learning at the time but we were getting an education whether we understood it or not that's the wisdom of years of seeing this cycle happen 20 30 40 times there is value in that um, I, I certainly don't have this all figured out but i I understand more today than I did 20 years ago. There's a great deal of value in the depth of experience. Um, you know, I, as the podcast has become more popular, I, I get lots of requests of people who are pitching and presenting me to have different guests on the podcast all the time. There was such a volume that it was necessary for me to write a letter describing what it is that I'm looking for in, in order to give people a, a kind letdown, a kind rejection. And in that letter, I wrote a key sentence, which is that decades of experience don't count for everything, but they certainly count for an awful lot. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Well, Bob, thank you very much for being here, for sharing your wisdom and the things that you've learned. I know that there are so many other things that we could talk about, but uh, it's been a real joy to have this conversation with you, and I look forward to having more discussions with you in the future. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to learn from you. I hope folks can get a mustard seed today. We covered a wide variety of topics. I'm very passionate about what we do. I love what I get to do for a living. I get to experience my faith every day in, in working with nature and agriculture. Uh, we're just very blessed to get to do what we do for a living, John. And I appreciate that and I appreciate your friendship. Thank you, Bob. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.